Hello, everyone. Congratulations on getting an offer of admission to UCLA School of Engineering. Um, so I, I uh, oversee the admissions process, and I want to tell you that this year was a, a really tough year to get that letter. Um, we, last year, we had 8,400 students applying for the 650 spots that we have in the School of Engineering. And this year, that number went up to 9,800 students, all trying to get those same 650 spots that we have in the school. So, so wow. Um, that's a really competitive process, and I think you guys should give yourselves a hand for being here. And so I'm going to kind of preside over this event, introducing the people who are going to tell you about various reasons why you might want to come to uh, UCLA. I mean, really what you're doing today, when you're picking a university, it's really about fit. There are lots of great universities. We're not the only great university, but you want to find the place that, that you know, feels right to you. Um, there are a lot of good qualities. We have really strong academics, um, excellent weather, except for today. Um, <laughs> a great urban environment surrounded by a lot of the companies that you might uh, work at when you graduate, a fantastic faculty. Um, and so let's go ahead and get started with our day. And I want to introduce to you the dean of our school, Dean V.J. Deer. I want to tell you a couple of things about V.J. Uh, one thing is that he is um, still doing some, uh, some research on heat transfer of boiling fluids. And he's going to be boiling some fluid in the next space shuttle mission. That's kind of cool, um, testing how the heat transfer happens with boiling fluids in space. Um, that may not be as important to you personally as something else that VJ has done. He's really taken it upon himself as dean of the school to raise a lot more funds specifically for fellowships and scholarships. One of the packets that you got today tells you about all of the scholarships that are available to our undergraduate students after they show up. So, you know, sometime in the fall of your freshman, you know, each year you can compete for these fellowships. And thanks to VJ, since he got here, there are 80 more of these fellowships than there were before he got started with this project. And he has plans to grow it even further. And that's a tremendous contribution to the school. He's also, at, during his time as dean so far, the faculty has grown and become a lot stronger, and you can see that we've hired a lot of faculty and done very well at it um, from the number of career awards and National Academy memberships and other things that the faculty that we're, we're bringing in, a lot of faculty to stay strong, and the faculty that we're bringing in are doing really well. So it really gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Dean V.J. Deer, the dean of our school. Thank you, Rick. Good morning. My warm welcome as well to all of the prospective students, their parents, and families to the open house of the UCLA Henry Samueli School of Engineering and Applied Science. Today is your day to learn as much as possible about UCLA the School of Engineering, the academic departments, and the programs. I want to begin by congratulating again all of the students, their parents, and families for students having done so well in their high school academics and standardized tests to be accepted to the School of Engineering. This is a marvelous achievement your parents should be proud of it. And as Rick mentioned, out of 10,000 or so applicants, there are going to be only 650 students who will be entering the school. So this is an accomplishment which we should recognize. So please give a big hand to all of our prospective students. And their families. It is truly admirable that you have chosen to be an engineer. You know, engineers are master builders. 
and creators of new technologies. Engineers conceive of ideas, concepts. Uh, they design, they develop and manufacture, they test, troubleshoot, and maintain new technologies. You all use cell phones, Blackberries, and so on. They're all creations of engineers. Engineering profession is the one which is going to bring this country and California out of its economic problems. Not the lawyers, not the Wall Street people. At engineering education, which we hope you are here to, to receive, there are several challenges. The engineering educational enterprise is composed of three basic components, those components being faculty and staff. Then is the programs and curriculum and the third is students. First, faculty and staff. At UCLA, we have some of the outstanding faculty, both at the junior and the senior level, who are recognized experts in their fields. As Rick mentioned earlier, uh, almost 70% of our junior faculty are recipient of the National Science Foundation's Career Award. This is a highly competitive award. Only about 15% of the applicants are selected for this recognition. Our senior faculty are equally distinguished. They have been recognized by their profession. Uh, one of the indicators is the number of uh, faculty who are members of the National Academy of Engineering we have close to 22 faculty who have that honor and election to the academy is the highest honor that can be bestowed on an engineer. We have even one Nobel laureate on our faculty and one who has obtained the Oscar award. <laughs> Irrespective of how distinguished or senior the faculty are, each one of them is required to teach at least one undergraduate course per year, if not two. All of our teaching is done by the faculty. We do hire temporary faculty from industry just to complement the expertise we have in-house, and individuals from industry bring their own experience to impart to the students. Uh, then, TAs, their role is to assist faculty and to provide educational experience to students outside of the classroom or in the laboratories. None of our classes are taught by TAs. The, sparks, the, the staff is extremely supportive and dedicated to facilitating students complete their degree objectives in the smoothest way possible. We have designed the curriculum so that the students, when they graduate, would be able to, to meet the challenges of the 21st century. You know, the problems of the 21st century are going to be very complex, and they would require uh, individuals with different talents uh, to come together to solve those multidisciplinary problems. As such, in our curriculum, while focusing on the fundamentals, we are requiring that every student take a three-course technical breadth in a discipline different than their major. For example, electrical engineers could take a three-course technical breadth in mechanical engineering, and vice versa. Uh, we also have these technical breadth areas at the school level. Uh, an example would be technology management, which is extremely popular with the students. It exposes students to, to entrepreneurship, 
to how to start a company, how to manage a company, what is engineering economics, and so on. Then we require students to take one course in ethics. Engineers have to uphold the highest ethical standards while designing and developing new technologies, new innovative devices and systems. We have a course on writing. Engineers must be able to communicate through writing as well as through oral presentations. So every student does have to take a course in technical writing. And recently, we have introduced a seminar course at the freshman level. Uh, that course is titled, What Students Need to Know About Engineering But Were Afraid to Ask. <laughs> Our uh, curriculum provides enough hands-on experience uh, during the course of your four-year uh, stay here. And that hands-on experience is uh, supplemented by students working on projects that are run by student chapters of various professional societies. We also encourage our students to spend one summer in an industry to do summer internship. We have educational coordinator whose job is basically to facilitate students finding an internship in industry. And we also recommend a second summer the students spend uh, on research projects with faculty in-house. And some of the critical technologies that are being developed in the school, which are extremely important to this country and to the world, are in the area of healthcare, uh, cyber security, uh, clean, green energy, water, and sustainability. The technologies we are developing are going to have big impact downstream 10, 15 to 20 years from now in the same way as internet had on our lives. You may not know or you may know internet was developed here at the UCLA School of Engineering. We are the birthplace of the internet. First message on internet was sent on October 29th, 1969. So you are going to be part of this exciting culture and exciting environment that we have to offer you. The third component is students. You as bright students eager to learn would be challenged. You're going to be challenged to think independently, to solve problems that are open-ended. You're going to challenge us by asking questions the answers to which we may not have. And you're going to challenge yourself by trying to accomplish much more than could be accomplished you thought you could do it. So then you say, OK, that's about ac academics. What about social life? UCLA is a large campus which has lots of opportunities for extracurricular activities. Uh, for example, in the area of social uh, uh, activities or uh, cultural activities or athletic activities. Uh, UCLA, uh, you may know, uh, is the very successful in athletics. Uh, UCLA athletes have 103 national uh, collegiate champion championships, which is the highest of any university in the nation. So my advice to all of the students is that go beyond your academics. Participate in cultural, social activities. You do not want to be one-dimensional. So go beyond your engineering uh, school academics. And those are necessary features of your overall education you want to be a complete individual. After you graduate, you could compete with anybody anywhere in the world. You have a very bright future ahead of you. Engineering is going to open many doors for you. Uh, could it be that you 
go to graduate school, join the profession, or you go to another discipline such as medicine, uh, business, or even law, although that's darker side. <laughs> so in closing, I would like to wish all of the students a very successful educational experience wherever you decide to go. To the students, their parents, and the families, thank you very much for coming and joining us this morning. It is a true pleasure to welcome you all, to see you all, and I wish you a wonderful day ahead. Thank you. Hello again. So the next phase of our um, presentation is going to go through the departments in the school. Each chair is going to get up and tell you a little bit about what's going on in their department. Because um, it might be the case that from your experience in high school, you really didn't get a good view of all the choices that engineers have. Uh, lots of schools have a robotics club, but not as many schools have a material science club or a bioengineering club, just because it's too expensive to do those kinds of things. Um, in fact, one of the things we realized this year is that it might, not, it might be the case that someone knows they want to be an engineer and doesn't know exactly what department they want to be in. So for the first time this year, we introduced the option of applying to the School of Engineering as an undeclared student. How many people, raise your hands, how many students here today went for that and applied undeclared? Yeah, I, I see several. So that's actually nothing. That's a great choice. So, so one of the things you need to learn as an engineer is when to say, I don't know yet because I don't have enough data. And we'll talk more about how to collect more data. Uh, you can, later on today, there's going to be an undeclared session. We'll talk about how you can figure out from among these departments what's going to be the best fit for you. But right now I want to move on through the chairs of the departments. Um, that we're going to start with the bioengineering department. And Professor Ben Wu is going to talk about the bioengineering department. I just want to say one thing about the bioengineering department and their focus on undergraduates. We started a new program in undergraduate advising this spring quarter where it, it has long been the case that every undergraduate is assigned a faculty advisor within the School of Engineering. But we wanted to make sure that, that the undergraduates were really taking advantage of their faculty advisor to get some, you know, to take advantage of the opportunities for mentorship and guidance that you could have by having that one-on-one -on -one relationship with a professor. So we ask all the professors to sign up for three hours during the second week of the quarter, you know, just publicly post them when they were going to meet with their uh, undergraduate advisees. And the undergraduate advisees see it on their own personal website. This is your advisor. This is when they can see you. And if, they're, if you, you're not available, then you can go see somebody else. Anyway, the bioengineering department, their faculty were the first to completely sign up for these time slots to make sure that they were available. And that, that's not a coincidence. You know, in my uh, time as associate dean working with the bioengineering department, I really see that focus. They're, they're, they pay attention to their undergraduates. So with that in mind, here's Professor Ben Wu. Thank you, Dean Wessel. That was a great introduction. Uh, I'd like to extend my congratulations to the parents. As a parent myself, I have young children, and I hope that in a few years I will be sitting in your seats looking up here, although I, I understand that the application process is getting harder and harder. <laughs> so uh, I think we have three to four minutes per department to tell you what it is that we do, and I think that that's pretty difficult, so let me get started. Uh, I think that by the end of the next half hour, you will see that engineers, besides master builders, we are great problem solvers. So bioengineering students, bioengineers solve medical problems. We work with doctors to solve medical problems. We work with biologists to come up with new quantitative tools to better study and analyze biology. And by better understanding biology, we'll be in a better position in the future to build better tools to help people. You know, in the 1950s, Congress established NIH, the National Institutes of Health, to focus national dollars to improve health care. In the 50s, we saw the establishment of many new technologies.
that didn't exist before, for example, um, just simple things like pacemakers. How many people know someone who has a pacemaker? 1950s. Okay, we're still building them. They're much better than ever before. Now they can have rechargeable batteries and, and new programming. But you know, th those are old technologies that our medical engineers developed in the 50s. Um, hot lung machines to help people during heart transplants. These are expensive equipment that NIH funded to establish so that doctors can do those procedures better. In the 1960s, the establishment of the Medicare Medicaid program further fuel companies to make more technologies to help doctors do a better job. So, you know, we have the establishment of ultrasound. How many people have seen pictures from ultrasound? I think you, you guys have all have seen those, right? 1960s. Hearing aids were established in the 1960s. You know, a decade later, implantable hearing aids were, were created. Nowadays, you know, I'm working with companies that are making hearing aids that you can wear in your mouth wirelessly, that you can hear without anybody seeing this hearing aid. So the technology is just flying right in front of our eyes. In the 1970s, we saw the establishment of HMOs. Insurance companies tried to cut costs and reduce um, financial burden. And so we saw the establishment of many imaging technologies to, you know, prevent diseases from happening or diagnose small lesions before they become very big. And what we saw was the establishment of CT scans. How many people have seen CT scans or had CT scans? PET scan, positive emission tomography were created at UCLA, actually. Um, so there were a lot of imaging technologies that were created. The first hip implant, total hip implant, the modern style hip implants were created in the 1970s you know, with the help of biomedical engineers. So there are a lot of technologies that biomedical engineers work on that impact society in every way possible. In the 1980s, you know, the FDA really figured out how to improve, how to approve uh, devices. And so we saw the establishment of many minimally invasive devices. Lasers were commonplace, angioplasty. Many types of um, small procedures become commonplace, endoscopy. These are things that we do as biomedical engineers. In the 1970s, the Human Genome Project basically took center stage. And for the next two decades, stem cell therapy, regenerative medicine, the first tissue engineer skin was created by biomedical engineers. And so these are some of the things that we do. Looking into the future, I think the students will be working at how to manipulate small molecules. They will manipulate cells. They will manipulate tissues. They will manipulate organisms, all in a ways to help improve healthcare. Um, as a practicing clinician myself, I could see how technology transformed the way I diagnose and how I treat patients. And as a clinician, I can only help one patient at a time. As engineers, you all can help many patients at one time. So I look forward to seeing you guys in the special session for bioengineering. So that's a uh... You know, that's something that's true about all of the engineering majors, this fact that we have an uncontrolled acceleration of technology. Now, that's not the technology of uncontrolled acceleration. I think that's what Toyota does. But, <laughs> um, but as you work with your, uh, as you learn engineering, this fact makes it very exciting, but at the same time, very difficult, because you've got a lot to learn just to catch up with this train it's not only going at 70 miles an hour, but accelerating. And your job, what you're trying to do with, with this undergraduate education, you're trying to run and catch up and get on that train, and then eventually be an engineer, drive the train um, as it moves forward, as it accelerates further. Um, and it's just such an exciting thing to do. So I, that's why I think it's such a great choice to choose to be an engineer. Um, but I'm talking too much. So, and, and also I want to remind the chairs that we do have a, you know, it's like three to four minutes we're looking for. So, um, I wanted to say um, our next speaker is Professor Mambuquet from the Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering um, Group. And even though, so that's chemical, but chemical and biomolecular, bio has a lot to do with a lot of the departments. For example, his research um, helps to address issues of addiction and Parkinson's disease. It's really exciting work. So, um, Hal, come on up.
Well, good morning and uh, welcome and congratulations. Um, I'm especially anxious to talk to our uh, future chemical and biomolecular engineers. I, I think there's just never been a better time to be a chemical and biomolecular engineer. And uh, as the future chemical and biomolecular engineers know, uh, chemicals, after all, are good, right? Virtually every tangible product out there is composed of chemicals. We are composed of chemicals, and chemical engineers play a role in, uh, in producing them. If it weren't for chemical engineers, we couldn't get in our car and drive it to work or to school in the morning. We couldn't uh, toast our toast. Uh, we wouldn't have uh, penicillin when we get sick. And uh, mom and dad, I know it's been a while, but it was actually a chemical engineer who invented those disposable diapers, <laughs> as well as Pringles. Uh, and there are chemical engineers that are employed over the hill at uh, Anheuser-Busch making our beer. Um, so chemical engineers, for chemical engineers, the opportunities really are incredibly broad. Yet the challenges are huge, too, right? How are we going to provide energy, potable water, uh, access to information, shelter, and so on for a, for a uh, growing human population in an environmentally sustainable manner? And this is just, these are just huge problems, right? And these are the problems that we're facing now and we're going to face in the future. And chemical and biomolecular engineers have a key role to play here. Of course, Chemical and biomolecular engineers aren't doing this alone. Uh, things are becoming increasingly collaborative, and that is with other engineers and with other scientists. And this makes things even more exciting, more fun. And it makes education at a place like the UCLA School of Engineering and Applied Science even more important, where all the engineering departments are very strong. So you get to work with engineers of a variety of disciplines and, and to look at uh, these challenging problems for the future. So I look forward to uh, discussing in more depth our, uh, our terrific programs in chemical and biomolecular engineering. And I really hope you uh, have a, a fun and enjoyable day today. Thank you. Okay, next up is civil and environmental engineering, and we're going to hear from Professor J.S. Chen, who was uh, just a, a couple of years ago named a chancellor's professor. He's a true scholar and a gentleman. J.S., come on. Good morning. Uh, welcome and congratulations. Uh, I'm very excited to be here to talk to you a little bit about uh, how our faculty and students interact beyond the classroom meetings. I believe you still remember Katrina, the recent earthquakes. It's just one after the other, just in the past few weeks. Our faculty are, and students are traveling in many different places. They just came back, actually, for example, last week from Chile. They are busy visiting uh, Indonesia and, and, Me and uh, Mexico. Uh, and then in California, we deal with uh, wildfires, when the weather is too dry and the weather is too wet, then we get landslide. Uh, we need the clean water systems. We need uh, a sustainable uh, environmental systems. And all of all this, our students and faculty, that they work together uh, to work on all these very important and challenging problems through the funded projects, through, for example, the classroom projects, the students get to collect data and do some analysis on all these things. Uh, students get to experience the practical side of the knowledge that they learn from the class. Uh, for example, through the independent study, working directly with our faculty and, and graduate students. Uh, they also have a lot of site visits. Uh, they work in our, our faculty's uh, research group that we encourage them to do that. So they get together and work on all these problems that are very closely related to the safety and the quality of our daily life. Uh, we have 16 faculty with uh, four major fields that you can see from the slides. Uh, the environmental engineering, the structural engineering, the mechanics, the geotechnical engineering, 
the hydrology and water resources. We have 16 faculty. So this is really a mid, medium sized department. But that creates the environment for faculty and students to work very closely together. We also have a very strong student uh, association and some student chapters. Uh, our faculty work very closely with them. And uh, so for example, they arrange seminar in addition to the departmental seminars. Uh, that they invite uh, speakers, not only from our own department, the faculty and graduate students, but also from uh, pra uh, practitioners from outside. Uh, they arrange site visits. They even arrange job fairs uh, twice a year. So for example, this year, more than 30 companies, they come here and interview with our students. So our students are all very well placed. Um, our faculty uh, are really the leaders in their field of expertise. Uh, this, you know, the quality of our education and, and, and research programs is reflected in our continuous increase of research expenditures over the past 10 years. Last year, for example, we had a 33% increase of our research expenditure compared to the year ago. And this year, for example, a group of our faculty received a $4.5 million NSF National Science Foundation grant uh, as an extension of a center for uh, earthquake uh, engineering simulation earthquake, uh, network. We are one of the 14 sites in the US. And uh, another example is uh, uh, that we received a $3.5 million grant from the National Science Foundation uh, for the professional development of, of uh, science and technology in engineering mathematics that benefits all our undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, so uh, I think uh, it is very exciting uh, in our department with all the activities. And I would also like to point out that last year, there's a document released by the American Society for Civil Engineers. It's called a report card. Uh, they evaluate the nation's infrastructure. They release a report card once every five years. And the last year's report card indicated that uh, there's a need of $2.2 trillion over the next five years to bring the nation's infrastructure in good condition. And uh, in fact, uh, President Obama's team already initiated this effort. And so I think uh, our students and our faculty as a whole are in a very good position to participate and contribute to this very important task for the nation. Uh, I hope that uh, I'll be able to provide you and our faculty and students will be able to provide you more inf useful information in la later breakout sessions. And uh, we look forward to, to talk to you, and we are here to help you. Thank you very much. Wait, wait, wait. So, so JS, what grade did the infrastructure get on the new report card? I think it's, uh, it, there are different items, but it's in between C's and D's. OK. So that's, thank you. So that's an improvement from the last time I looked at the report card that was mostly D's. But, the, the, that national infrastructure report card. But the thing that you have to realize is that those C's and D's mean that your A's and B's will lead to a job. There is a lot of work that needs to be done <laughs> or, uh, with the nation's infrastructure, and the, it's the civil engineers that are going to do it. And if you think about the importance of civil engineering, I mean, think about this. Think about the difference between what happened in Haiti and what happened in Chile. Haiti, not so much civil engineering. Chile, serious engineering for earthquakes. It's a matter of life and death. And you, do not, you don't have to leave the state to find a place that needs that. So there are a lot of opportunities for that. So now, um, the next up, Adnan Darwish is going to talk about the Department of Computer Science. Uh, a lot of cool things. I love programming. And actually, my research in electrical engineering is closely related to some of the stuff that Professor Darwish does himself. With these, I work with message passing algorithms. And so this All right, I have the long slide. Good morning, everyone. I'm Adnan Darwish, Chair of Computer Science, and I'll use my few minutes uh, to talk about the uh, department and the field. And now we have the right slide here. Thank you. Uh, I guess it's uh, probably fair to say that uh, computer science uh, is probably one of the most exciting fields to be in and has been for some time, uh, not just because of the fun rich and intellectually stimulating subjects that our students get involved with uh, at the undergraduate level, but also because of the uh, very exciting and innovative career opportunities that await them uh, when they graduate. 
Uh, if you look up there on the screen, uh, I show some examples of the uh, subjects that our students get exposed to uh, during their undergraduate education here. Uh, I'm gonna say a few words about each and what career opportunities they, they lead to, but let me first stress that in many institutions, some of these areas are not even available to students at the undergraduate level and they're basically reserved for graduate education. We have, however, uh, embarked on a serious effort to make as many of these available to our undergraduates, typically in terms of electives, uh, to allow them to actually uh, cater for their interests and for their needs and for their career objectives. Uh, if you look at uh, software systems and uh, software engineering, this is one of the backbones, of course, of any education in computer science. Uh, all of our students get heavy training in this area, preparing them to take on careers in uh, the software industry, working for some giants like uh, Microsoft, Apple, or more specialized companies like Semantic, Facebook, mostly contributing to softwares that affect our uh, uh, life on a daily basis from Microsoft Word and Excel to virus detection systems to social networking systems and uh, uh, similar uh, products. Uh, our students also get education in uh, computer architecture and hardware, especially if they specialize in the computer engineering track. We have two tracks in this area, again, preparing them for uh, uh, careers uh, in companies like Intel and IBM, where they can contribute to the design of hardware systems uh, that get shipped to households and industries, again, uh, all over the world. Uh, they can actually opt to take more specialized courses in areas like uh, computer animation and graphics. Um, earlier, VJ mentioned that one of our faculty has an Oscar. Actually, that's not for a supporting actor role. Uh, that's actually for his work in the area of animation and their contributions to uh, uh, that industry. Uh, people can take classes in the area of artificial intelligence, uh, which is concerned with uh, building software and hardware systems that are smart and intelligent and adapt to human behavior. Uh, examples of these uh, are navigation systems that we see in our uh, cars today, uh, machine translation systems that we see on the web that translate between different languages to make it easier for people to browse uh, uh, topics in languages that they're not familiar with, uh, again preparing them for corresponding careers. Uh, we have recently um, uh, made an aggressive effort to make topics in, or classes in bioinformatics available at the undergraduate level. Uh, this is an area at the intersection of computer science and biology with uh, great potential in, in, in future areas like personalized medicine. Uh, some of our undergraduates can actually get exposed to that as early as, again, their undergraduate careers and so on. I can go on. Let me just mention internet computing as one of the also uh, main strengths in our department. Uh, in fact, uh, as some of you may already know, the very first message on the internet uh, actually went out from our department about 40 years ago uh, from here, Boitel Hoare, third floor, and that's why our department at the school is uh, typically known as the birthplace uh, of the internet. Uh, the one thing I wanna mention here is, uh, towards the end, is uh, our undergraduate program is one of the highlights, but we have about 350 graduate students also in, in our department. And the reason I'm mentioning this is uh, the graduate program is run by some of the finest research faculty in the world who are doing research and innovations in all of these areas. And it's exactly those faculty that are teaching our undergraduate students in these subjects. Uh, we rely very little on outside lecturers. And I want to mention this because in many institutions there is a greater and greater reliance on people from outside the department to handle undergraduate education. We do very little, if any, of that in our uh, department. So you'll hear about most of this uh, later today in our open house. You'll hear from some of our alumni about their experience with the department, our uh, current students on their current experience and some of our faculty. I personally will be there. Uh, I look forward to talking to you more about the department, about the field, and until then, um, Again, welcome to UCLA, and I hope you will have the most enjoyable uh, rest of the visit. Thank you. Thank you, Adnan. Thank you, Adnan. Um, you know, let's face it. No matter which major you go into, you're going to have to be, in some sense, a little bit of a computer scientist. Because no matter what type of engineering you do, today, you're going to do it on a computer. And so in the School of Engineering, um, no matter what major you're in, sooner or later you're going to be taking a class in the computer science department, CS31, a C++ programming class, that for, for many students it's considered uh, a challenge, but also a wonderful experience. It's, you have to work very hard in that class, but when you come out of it, 
you know how to program a computer. Not just point and click, but really make it happen. So we're really proud of that class and of everything that's going on in the computer science department. Now we come to electrical engineering, which is my home department. And so I have um, an unusual chance to see you know, the everyday workings going on in that department and, and what the chair, Professor Ali Syed, does. And I have to tell you that you know, in, in that time since he's, since he's been chair, um, so there must be some kind of Ali Syed time machine because he does a lot of research, he writes textbooks, but he also spends about 24 hours a day working tirelessly to make the electrical engineering department the best that it can possibly be. And Ali has a special way of doing this. You know, he's single-mindedly doing everything he can to make electrical engineering the best that it can be and doesn't let um, things stand in his way. So, for example, for this um, presentation today, the, the chairs were all told, we only have three or four minutes, give us one slide. So Ali Syed used the latest PowerPoint technology to give us one slide that goes through ten different slides. <laughs> and and our, our, you know, the, the person who organizes this event came up to me and said, you know, Dean Wessel, what are we going to do about this? You know, he, he, you know, we said one slide, he has ten slides. And I looked at it and I, and I, and I watched how it went through these ten slides in exactly the allowed amount of time. And I said, you know what? Really, this is what we ought to have all the chairs do. It's really much better than what we've done before. And so, you know, let him do it. He's doing the best thing he can for electrical engineering and taking the school forward. And that's what Ollie always does. So here's Professor Syed. Thank you very much, Rick. He had the power to veto that, but fortunately he didn't. <laughs> okay. I am Professor Said. I'm from the Electrical Engineering Department. Uh, on behalf of my faculty, staff, and students, I would like to welcome you here at UCLA today and at our school. I will be talking to a group of you later today in the Electrical Engineering session. But in these few minutes, I would like to address the young minds that are sitting here, and especially those that haven't made up their mind yet about what specialization to follow. So I would like to talk to the undeclared students and those who have declared other areas as well. Please consider electrical engineering. You know, <laughs> this is, as you are seeing through these slides, electrical engineering is pervasive throughout society and electrical engineering education will make of you a, a deep thinker it will launch your creativity, your inventive spirit. You will be able to think of big ideas, create new devices, new processing, new architectures that make a huge difference to society. Dean Deere earlier said that engineers create ideas and create devices, and he's right. And I would say that electrical engineers create great ideas and great devices. And if you want to do that, EE is the place for you. You know, and, uh, and to prove that, just look around you. you know, everything, almost everything you do today or you use has electronics in it. None of us here would be able to talk with you without some electronics. Do you hear me? You can't hear me, right? <laughs> you see? So when people ask me, I tell them electrical engineering is magic, and this is how I prove it to them, magic in a good sense, okay? So look at your cell phone, right? This is a device that you can use to talk to a person on the other side of the world without a wire connecting both of you. Had I told you this, that you would be able to do this a hundred years ago, you would have laughed at me. This is magic. Just think about how much creativity, how much complexity, how much thinking, how much science, how much physics went and how much chemistry went into this. Batteries are chemistry, okay, so. <laughs> right? This is incredible. When you visit your doctor and you lie down on that imaging machine that can peek into your body and get these complex images without even touching you, isn't that incredible? Isn't that magic? How much thinking went into creating a device like that, that can peek into your body and give these images that can save lives? When you launch a robot, launch a, a rover into space, and land it on a planet far away. Not even a human being has set foot on that planet. And then maneuver that robot on the surface of that planet. Isn't that magic? 
Think about how much complexity, how much thinking, how much modeling, how much analysis went into designing a system like this. That's what electrical engineers do all the time. You know, you think, you model, you think of big ideas, of big problems. You know, if I tell you today, how many of you would love to have eyeglasses that you can look into and see through that wall? <laughs> right. Many of you will think that's impossible. An electrical engineer will never tell you that that's impossible. They will keep chipping at this problem bit by bit and bite by bite. Years ahead, a decade from now, a century from now, they will give you a device. All of you will love to use, just like your cell phone. All of you will take it for granted. And none of you will think about that you laugh today at it, right? That one day you thought that was, that was impossible. That's what electrical engineers do. They think of big ideas, and let's see what we can do to help society. So if that's what you would like to do, EE is the right place to you for you, okay? I will see you later and talk to you. Thank you. Okay, so next up in the battle of the departments is uh, <clears throat> the, the Department of Material Science and Professor Jinming Yang. And Professor Jinming Yang cares so much about the undergraduates. This material science is a special uh, major because it has the ability to give a, a lot of attention to its undergraduates. I was part of, when I, before I became associate dean, I was part of a review panel for that department. And what came out of that review was this sense from the undergraduates of how well treated they are, how much a part of the department, the kind of attention that they get. And just to give you a sense of that, Jin Ming comes in and takes a personal role in making the final admission decisions into the, the department, comes in and we sit down and talk about each student who's on the borderline. It's really interesting. So um, here to tell you about material science is Professor Jin Ming Yang. Thank you and welcome. And every Sunday morning, I try to go to a farmer's market. When you walk by, it, each vendor will tell you that the melon and the strawberry from my field are the sweetest. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that material science engineering is as sweet as any other engineering discipline. <laughs> if you don't believe it, come on, give a try. <laughs> so most of you in high school may not be that familiar with the field of uh, material science and engineering as compared to other traditional engineering fields such as uh, chemical, civil, mechanical, or electrical engineering. So you may ask, why do we study materials? And what is material science and engineering? To answer the question, let me start by saying that uh, virtually every segment of our daily life is influenced to one degree or another by materials. So in fact, historically, the development and advancement of society have been intimately tied to the members' ability to produce and manipulate materials to fulfill their uh, needs. So uh, materials essentially is the core enabling technology for all the engineering disciplines and is critical to the development of new products. For example, most of you may have iPhone, iPad, or iPad. Just imagine how many materials that we need to use to produce these uh, uh, small devices. It involves metals, ceramic, semiconductor, polymers, as well as composite materials. So at the heart of the material science and engineering discipline is an understanding of the structure of solids from microscopic down to nanoscales. Indeed, much of the recent interest in nanoscience and nanotechnology stems from our ability to manipulate the structure of solids at the nano scale. So our program offers our undergraduate students the opportunity to learn about many fascinating aspects of materials, including synthesis, processing, property, and performance of advanced materials. And the department is relatively small. However, we are growing. Our research expenditure and our undergraduate populations are at all-time high. So we believe the close linkage of materials science with the important challenge in our society today, such as energy, environment, 
communication, health, and infrastructure is the most significant reason for the growth of our undergraduate population and will continue to be so in the years ahead. And our undergraduate class size are typically 25 to 35 students. This allows our faculty and students to get to know each other quite well and provide individual attention. Also, the department's commitment to the student does not end with courses. Okay. Our faculties actively involve interested undergraduate students in cutting-edge research projects, which can be arranged as an employment opportunity or for academic credits. So we believe that the material science and engineering department at UCLA can provide you with outstanding and exciting educational opportunity and research experience. Once again, I welcome you to UCLA, and I look forward to having more in-depth discussion with you. Thank you. OK, last but not least, Professor Adrian Levine, Chair of the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. And let me tell you a little bit about Adrian. Adrian um, was former, just came off of being Chair of the Academic Senate of UCLA, sort of leading the faculty of the entire UCLA campus before she became Chair of the Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department. And as Chair of the Mechanical Engineer and Aerospace Engineering Department, She's taken a great interest in making sure that, so let's face it, mechanical and aerospace engineering is a popular major and lots of students want to do it. And it can be a big job to make sure that all those students get the classes that they need to graduate. But Adrian takes a, a detailed interest in each class, making sure that we accommodate those students to make sure that they can graduate on time. And that kind of attention to undergraduate you know, success and making sure that it's going to happen is something that, that is, a, is a hallmark of the Mechanical Engin Aerospace Engineering Department. And here to tell you about it is Adrian Levine. Thank you, Rick. Thanks for noticing. <laughs> so our department houses two majors, Mechanical Engineering, which is, I'd say, the broadest major in the school, and Aerospace Engineering, which is probably the most focused. Mechanical Engineering addresses motion and energy. So if you think of all the engineered systems that involve either motion or energy, well, they're countless. I mean, familiar things like automobiles, but, but also exotic micro-machines, uh, the flow of blood in an artificial heart, um, power plants, emerging alternative energy systems, and, and much more. That's the broad domain of a mechanical engineer. And just about any industry that employs engineers will employ mechanical engineers. And then we have aerospace engineering, which addresses aircraft and spacecraft, very focused. I think nothing captures the imagination more than flight and space exploration. That's something students can be really passionate about, like Megan MacArthur, who you see in the picture uh, bit, uh, behind me. Uh, Megan is a UCLA aerospace engineering alumna from 1993. And that photo was taken last May when Megan flew on the, the final space shuttle mission to service the Hubble Space Telescope. So whether you're interested in aerospace engineering like Megan or mechanical engineering like me, uh, the, the strong fundamental education that you'll receive at UCLA will not only prepare you to, to improve upon familiar engineered systems like cars and planes, but it will also enable you to continue to learn throughout your lifetime always remaining at the cutting edge, and, and to attend graduate school should you choose so that you can contribute to knowledge like our faculty and graduate students do, and to conceive of and create innovative solutions to the world's truly pressing problems. So our students are fantastic. They are bright, hardworking, motivated, creative, collaborative, probably sounds a lot like you, and, and they, they come to UCLA with a little knowledge and a great desire to learn how to analyze and create devices and processes that will benefit humanity or maybe just make our lives a little more interesting. Um, our students don't only learn from their distinguished colleagues in, in their, in the, I mean, from their distinguished faculty in the classrooms, but from the bright students around them. And um, many of them seize the opportunity to do research in faculty labs. Uh, many have summer internships in industry, 
and others get involved in engineering projects that are sponsored by our student societies, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, the Society of Automotive Engineers, and UCLA Robotics. In fact, when Megan was at UCLA, she um, took part in a team that designed, built, and raced a two-person um, submersible, a flooded submersible. And she has described that experience as having been crucial to her education. When you come to our departmental open house later, you'll meet the students who are working on projects like that. You'll see how creative and dynamic our students are. So come, and, come to UCLA, join them, and, and take part in some of that excitement. And um, so I really look forward to seeing you later. I, I wanted to take care of one small piece of business. At our departmental open house, we're going to be splitting the group into two halves by letter of the alphabet. Everyone come to Young Hall, and then we'll instruct you. But ha the first half of the alphabet will go into our information session, while the second half has lunch and mingles with students and alumni and faculty, and then we'll switch to the two groups. So I'll see you there. Thank you. I'm an engineer. But Talking about those projects, the student projects are so important. Being part of the student organizations is part of your undergraduate education. You can't just take the classes and graduate and get what you need to be a successful engineer. You have to learn how to work with groups of people and teams. And a really important group um, is the Society of Women Engineers. They are a driving force in, in our um, School of Engineering. And I want to give you a sense of, of the undergraduate experience from a student point of view. I'm now going to introduce our alumnus, Jacqueline Leong, who now works at Amgen, but was an, in, an engineering student here at UCLA and, a, and a, an important part of the Society of Women Engineers. So Jacqueline, come on. Good morning, everyone. Congratulations, students, and welcome to UCLA. My name is Jacqueline Leong. I graduated 2004 with a computer science and engineering degree. Um, I've worked at Amgen with four different major roles. I've become an executive member of a nonprofit organization, and I recently joined the CS Alumni Advisory Board. When I was asked to speak to you today, I started to think about all the things I did to decide on college. Much like you, I made a list of pros and cons, visited all the different universities, and learned about their different engineering programs. But in the end, my decision came down to this. Where will I be able to pursue my academic goals meet people who share my passions, and still have fun all at the same time? Well, you know the answer to that question. Um, <clears throat> all of you are at the top of your class, and we know you're going to be successful wherever you go. But ask yourself this, where will you have fun to prepare yourself to change the world? Hopefully you'll find that that answer is UCLA. And let me tell you why I love being a Bruin and why you will love being a Bruin as well. Being a Bruin means instantly being a part of a family with a great legacy, a family where you already have something in common with someone else, and most importantly, being a Bruin means having the skills, resources, and friendships to support you in every project you tackle. UCLA Engineering empowers their students with opportunities to change the world, be it through numerous on-campus clubs, different engineering competitions, or just mentoring fellow Bruins. While I was at UCLA, joined two engineering clubs, one of which was SWE, the Society of Women Engineers. And being involved with SWE was one of the best decisions I could have made. First, it was easy to go to meetings, get free food, socialize with people, but soon I became restless and wanted to do more. I wanted to take responsibility, give back to the club, and become an officer. I've always enjoyed attending the SWE Evening with Industry, um, so I joined the committee that organized that event. The Evening with Industry is an annual event that SWE puts on. They invite company representatives from 30 different engineering companies to spend dinner with you. It's a great opportunity to network with company representatives and jumpstart your career with an internship or a full-time position. I highly recommend attending this dinner. Being a part of that committee taught me a lot of things. I learned how to interface with company professionals. I learned how to work with people I didn't always see eye to eye with. But most importantly, I learned that I love to work with people. It was so much fun working with fellow students and company representatives that I became the engineering, <coughs> sorry, external vice president the following year. Leadership qualities that you pick up as a club officer are invaluable. As EVP, my responsibilities were to organize information sessions, which is when you invite a company's 
representative to come to UCLA and talk to students. At these events, you learn about various job opportunities, and you learn how to be successful at that company, and you just get to meet cool people. One of the companies that I invited was Amgen, a biotechnology company in Thousand Oaks, and that Amgen manager that came ended up hiring me later that year. She was impressed by my leadership, professionalism, and well-roundedness. But college is not all about school and engineering and boosting your resume. To truly enjoy and love UCLA, you have to step outside of Bolter Hall. I joined the Association of Chinese Americans, better known as ACA. At first, it was a great way to meet people outside of my engineering classes. Later, I joined the Lion Dance team, and that was an amazing experience. Not only did I learn how to lion dance, but I got to learn about the rich history and give back to the younger members by teaching them as well. We've become such a close-knit group that I continue to come back to UCLA to help with practices and performances. And it's very rewarding to watch the team grow and mature, and I hope you get a chance to see them perform here. If social clubs aren't for you, you can always join an intramural team. I was introduced to IM Sports through my engineering friends, and I quickly found out you don't need to be good to be on a team. In fact, I joined a co-ed basketball team, um, and our first game was against some graduate students. Their shortest player was taller than our tallest player. Needless to say, we got a pretty good beat down, but it was still fun going out, playing with your friends, having other friends cheer you on, and uh, when else can you play basketball in Poly Pavilion? I can't believe how fast my time at UCLA flew by. When I graduated, all I could wish, all I could wish was that I was back here at UCLA, going to football games, helping with SWE events, performing with the Lion Dance team. But little did I know, my time at UCLA was not over. When I first started Amgen, we were put into a group called the Amgen College Hire Network. It was just like being back at school. Uh, we had leaders, committees, groups, all run by people straight from college, and we even had a recruiting organization. I instantly gravitated, gravitated towards being the UCLA recruiting lead, and I organized numerous events um, with the different engineering clubs here at UCLA. I love coming back here to talk about my job and how much fun it is, because it really is fun. Starting at Amgen as a business analyst, it wasn't like anything I expected coming from a computer science and engineering background. I always imagined, imagined sitting in a little cube, coding to my heart's desire, but instead I got to work with people, developers, and manage projects. The responsibility and respect I got as an entry level college hire was amazing. I changed roles to work with infrastructure and then again in application support, and now, my, now I'm back managing projects but as a technical lead. And I've been very fortunate to have managers that support my random transitions and let me try new things. It helps keep me excited about work and grow as a professional. Outside of work, I help with a nonprofit called Project Possibility. One of my engineering classmates actually founded this group. Uh, project Possibility is a community service project oriented, com or, sorry, Project Possibility is a community service project committed to creating groundbreaking open source software for persons with disabilities. Our mission is to inspire the community of persons with disabilities and software developers to work together to make a difference by inventing software that will unlock new areas of life for persons with disabilities. Just last month, we concluded a UCLA versus USC weekend coding competition with the help of ACM, the Association of Computing Machinery Club. I was blown away by how smart and creative the current CS students are, and I'm proud to say UCLA took first and second place. <laughs> the winning team created a mobile currency reader to help people with visual impairments. This is a big issue since U.S. currency is all the same shape and size. In fact, the U.S. Treasury even approached Project Possibility to submit a proposal for funding to complete this project. And to think it only took six UCLA students a weekend coding event at the cost of food and drinks to make this much progress. Amazing. Do you know how revolutionary that is? How many lives that can improve? To top it all off, UCLA's winning team was mostly undergraduate students, and they beat out USC's master students. <laughs> Thank you.
if that doesn't speak to the quality of the UCLA professors preparing students, I don't know what will. Also, for all you non-CS engineers, uh, Project Possibility is working with SWE um, in, organize, in sponsoring a team tech group, which is building a ball for blind children. Can't wait to see what they produce at the end of this year. Earlier this week, I attended my first computer science and alumni advisory board meeting, and I was very impressed at the level of enthusiasm and commitment that everyone showed. When I was a student, I had no idea there was this group of alumni making decisions and suggestions and improving my schooling. I'm excited to be a part of that group and have the opportunity to further improve your potential experience here. Thinking back to my undergrad at UCLA brings back some truly awesome memories. I know that I wouldn't be the person I am today without the foundation that UCLA and the School of Engineering has provided me today. I know that someday one of you, or some of you, will be standing here telling your UCLA story, encouraging the next generation of students to become a part of this great university. Welcome to UCLA, and I look forward to seeing you around campus. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. And I, I really want to point out that, that aspect of Jacqueline's trajectory that I think is part of the UCLA spirit, that it's not enough just to get an engineering degree, well, just to, to get this really difficult degree that you have to work really hard for, and then just go out and make a lot of money. That's not the whole picture. A lot of people here have this Bruin spirit that they're going to become an engineer, not just because it's a career, but because they can change lives, because they can make a difference. And that's what makes being here so satisfying, looking at that happen. That's something that I can really feel good about helping make happen and helping these students do the great things that they're going to do. Okay, now we're going to watch a video um, about student life here at UCLA. So let's roll the video. I was taking physics as a senior and I like math and I like my physics class a lot and someone suggested, uh, why don't you be an engineer? I was like, what's an engineer? You're going to love it here. Um, Tina, Ju Tina Ju, president of the Engineering Society of the University of California. There are so many different engineering organizations that the Engineering Society of, Univer of the University of California, ESUC, kind of manages everything. There's actually an executive board meeting where all the student, how often is that? Every other week, the executive board gets together. How many organizations? 30. 30. 30 student groups, and they're coordinated together. And actually, this Wednesday, um, every quarter I have a lunch in my office where I meet with the student leaders so that we can work a little bit more together. To, so how can the student organizations work together to make UCLA a better place, and what things can we do better in our Office of Academic and Student Affairs? But anyway, Tina's going to spend a couple of minutes telling you about her, her time at UCLA right now. Good morning, welcome to UCLA, and congratulations on your admission. Um, my name is Tina Jo, and I'm the president of the Engineering Society of UCLA. Uh, today I'll be speaking to you about the wonderful student life that UCLA Engineering has to offer. So I'll start by talking a little bit about my experience at this school. I'm currently a fourth year here studying bioengineering, and when I was applying to college, I had a lot of trouble deciding which major to pick. But I was good at math and science, and I kind of wanted to earn a lot of money, so I figured engineering would be a good choice. Um, during my time here, however, I've had many challenging courses, um, exciting research experiences, and rewarding internships. And from these, I've grown to love the major that I picked, and I'm proud to be part of the engineering school. UCLA also offers much more outside of academics. I got involved in student organizations at the end of my sophomore year when I became an officer for the Society of Women Engineers, and I've been active in clubs ever since. Through these organizations, I met some of my best friends, including my three roommates, all of whom are officers of various engineering clubs. These clubs also help greatly with the development of communication and leadership skills and provide valuable opportunities for you to interact with faculty, industry, and alumni. 
If you're looking for internships or jobs, attend info sessions and career fairs put on by organizations such as SWE. Or if you're just looking to mingle with fellow students of your major, check out groups like the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, for example. There are even engineering honor societies, such as Tau Beta Pi and Eta Kappa Nu for those overachievers, which I'm pretty sure there are quite a few of in this room. Um, the largest engineering society on campus, however, is the Engineering Society of UCLA, with over 200 members and 20 officers. We serve as an umbrella organization for the other 30 or so engineering groups on campus and provide a connection between the engineering students, faculty, and industry through our mentorship, info session, and social events. So in the end, whichever activities you choose to do, whether you choose to focus on academics, research, or student organizations, I'm sure that you will have a great experience here at UCLA. Please enjoy the open house activities planned for today, and I wish you all the best of luck in your college decision process. Thank you. OK, so new on the program this year, we're going to hear from the Office of Parent and Family Programs. Here's Jacqueline Gilliam. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to see you all here. Um, first, I'd like to say congratulations. You know, we've heard congratulations to the students, but also congratulations to the parents. Um, you're all sitting here today because your sons and daughters have been admitted to UCLA as the academic elite, the talented, and the driven. But we really recognize that they didn't get here alone. It was in a great part to you pushing and prodding and encouraging them to excel. Well, we also recognize here at the university that there's only three months difference between a high school senior and a college freshman. And the growth that's necessary for your children um, will happen over their next four years and beyond. So we don't expect you just to sever that relationship now that they're 18. I know that when I went to college, it was interesting because we didn't have cell phones. and. To make a long distance call was pretty expensive and pretty much I only saw my family on holidays and, and uh, when I had to travel for some kind of family event. There has been a cultural shift and parents are much more engaged and involved in their students' lives and the university wants to make sure that we provide you with information and assistance to help your student be successful here at UCLA. Um, my office is the Office of Parent Programs and we have a few things in place for parents and families. That is one, the parent helpline, where if you call that number, you'll get a live person that can help you with a variety of, of, of issues or questions. Um, what we see as main concerns for new parents in particular is size of UCLA, transition, safety, uh, the first year experience, roommate discrepancies, but that's just, a tip of the iceberg. We get all kinds of questions and inquiries. Nothing's too small and nothing's too big. So please don't hesitate to call if you have any concerns. We also have email assistance. My Bruin is at ucla.edu. So if you don't want to call and you want to remain anonymous, you can email us. Um, and then we also have a newsletter. Our newsletter goes out nine times a year. And it is, um, it'll come from Bruin Link. And in that newsletter, it really contains the nuts and bolts of how to be successful here. Uh, we have a Facebook, and I have to admit that when my staff first told me about starting a parent Facebook, I have a junior in high school. And when Facebook first came along, I joined just so I could spy on her. She wouldn't friend me, and so I just kind of put it to the wayside. And my staff, they're all young alums from UCLA. So they came to me and they said, hey, Jackie, you know, in January, about 6 million people in your demographic joined Facebook. OK, great, my demographic, what does that mean? I guess people in their 40s are using Facebook. So I still was a little hesitant. I said, well, what could we do on Facebook? Well, we decided to use Facebook in a different way. We do not use Facebook in the same way that your students use it. We use it really to push out information. So we use it to provide information about dates and, and different things that are happening on campus, as well as address certain um, 
emergencies that happen on campus. So we use it for that, but you'll also get emails not only from me in my office, but all the information to parents and families from the chancellor also comes from us. So if you need anything, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, lastly, we do have a big event in October, uh, October 29th through the 31st that is our parents weekend. It's essentially back to school night at the college level and we strategize in, in coordinating that event thinking that three months into the time that your students here, it's just when the novelty of college wears off, they're starting to get homesick, you're starting to miss them and we want you to come back to campus. You'll get an opportunity to engage with the engineering professors during an open house but it is a time when you'll be able to talk to them more about your, your children's experience and what's going on at the school. So lastly, I want to leave you with something that a parent told me recently and it really stuck with me. It said, you know, Jackie, I have to remember that my, my child is the person that I helped create. Um, and that uh, this Navajo proverb she, she left me with is, we raise our children to leave us. College is the supreme moment of parenting. Keep in mind, you're not only losing your child, but gaining an adult. And we hope that you will not only allow your student to become a Bruin, but you'll also become part of the Bruin family. For those of you who have decided to become a Bruin already, welcome. And for those of you who haven't come over to the Bruin side, we hope to see you here in the fall as well. Thanks so much. Okay, and now Julie Austin is going to tell you about the CSNET computing facility. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to first tell you I know you're getting a ton of information, so don't panic if you don't remember anything I say. You can always email us. Um, there's a piece of paper in your packet that explains a little bit about um, how to get a CSNET account and you're gonna see in a few seconds why you probably wanna have one of those. Um, we handle, as you can tell, all the technical needs from each of these academic units are very diverse. So we handle instruction or instructional computing for each of the academic units. Um, this is only, these services are only for engineering students or students taking engineering courses. So you guys, we consider you our customer and you're our main goal to try and make sure we're meeting your needs. Um, we do email the student once every quarter that gives you sort of an update on what we do offer just in case you, you forget any of it or you didn't think you needed something earlier and now maybe you do. Um, or you can always email us, um, help at cs.ucla.edu. We're happy to do that, um, answer any of your questions. Uh, we have four open computer labs, uh, one instructional lab that's reserved just for courses. There are in those labs about 200 window machines, and we've got about uh, uh, a little bit over a dozen Linux end user machines. Our back end, though, is all Linux and Solaris, which means at any point from any server, you can be using Solaris, Linux, Windows, um, pretty much anything you'd want to be using for anything you're doing for your courses. We also have a remote server, which allows you to access 24-7 uh, the Windows lab environment or the Unix lab environment. So, you can pretty much do your coursework anytime. Our typical hours for our labs are 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. We do extend the hours 5th through 10th week till 2 a.m. So you can always find a lab computer available. I'd say our, our busiest times are generally around lunchtime. I think everybody goes and checks their email at that point. Uh, the, we have uh, lab consultants on duty. Uh, whenever the labs are open, those are generally students just like you. In fact, today I know you have in your schedule to go visit the CSNET labs from two to four. One of the lab consultants on, on duty today is an engineering student and he's happy to answer any of your questions about engineering. Or the other lab consultant is happy to answer any of your questions about the labs themselves. The 
Labs are actually open tonight till 11, so don't panic if you're not going to be able to get to see them at between 2 and 4. Um, keep in mind that the lab consultants, their office is on the second floor lab, which is 2684 Bolter Hall. But the other labs, you can feel free to wander around and look at those. We do offer help desk programming support uh, during regular business hours, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Uh, my staff are pretty good, so they'll know if you're asking us to do your homework. Uh, but they're happy to help out if you're running into sort of technical issues and need clarification how to use a piece of software or something like that. Uh, and we do have, I think the last time I counted it was about 170 engineering software packages. So you're not expected to have <laughs> all that software on your own machine, and nor would you probably want to since some of it is very expensive. But we make sure it's available for you for your classes. There are printing services. We charge a nominal fee. We just charge you for toner and paper from any of the labs. Uh, that gets charged to your URSA account, which is the account that you're billed for your courses as well. We also have a, two course management systems in the School of Engineering, CourseWeb for the courses with the exception of electrical engineering, and elect electrical engineering has EEWeb. The, it gives you one place to handle all your uh, engineering courses, and as Dean Wessel mentioned, your undergrad advising will also be available through CourseWeb. The other, there's a piece of CourseWeb that was actually developed, I like to mention it, because it was developed by the Association for uh, Computing Machinery, which you've heard us talk about before. It's Course Chat, and they integrated it in with CourseWeb. So we've tried very hard to work with our students and the student associations to make sure we're giving you the tools you need in order to do your coursework. Finally, I want to talk, the one question I get asked every year, and this is probably my 13th year standing up here, is what kind of computer should I get my student, or what kind of a computer should I buy when I come to engineering? Uh, we try very hard not to tell you what to buy because we believe a computer is a very personal choice. Um, you know more than we do what you're, how you're going to use it and what you're going to use it for. But I can tell you that we're going to have the computing resources you need to run the majority of your coursework. Um, that's not the majority, all of your coursework, but the majority of the engineering programs you're in lead. That being said, the School of Engineering is a member of the Microsoft Developer Networking Academic Alliance program, which means as a student enrolled in one credit engineering course, you get access to hundreds of free Microsoft software. The only exception to that is Office. That's pretty much the only one you won't be able to get to. Um, I like to mention that, and I know there's a lot of Mac users out there. I can tell you um, I have had at least one student I know in a, I believe it was civil engineering, tried to run Autodesk software, which we also offer for free to engineering students. Um, and it wouldn't run on the Mac that was running Windows. So I sort of like to point that out. Um, we're very, we're very much a Windows shop in, in that that's what we see mostly. We'll help as much as we can with problems with Mac computers, but just keep in mind that because most of the software runs on Windows, that's really what we know best. Um, the campus does have free antivirus software, so once you have your student ID, you can go to bol.ucla.edu and pull that down so you don't have to purchase antivirus software. They also have free virtual private networking software, which means anywhere you want to work in the world, you have access to the UCLA network and can access things like the UCLA library resources, journal articles, and that type of thing. Um, the one thing I want to tell you, if you're going to buy a computer, don't skip on memory. The one thing engineers need, it's more memory. I just can't tell you how quickly we have to upgrade memory. Um, I also would suggest that you talk to other students, especially if you know what area you're going to go into. They'll give you a very good idea of what their computer needs are as well. Um, there's also discounts on Macintosh computers at the UCLA Student Store. And there's also discounts on HP, Dell, and um, I believe IBM computers 
through uh, the campus vendor KST data, and there's information about that up on CSNET's website and the Office of Academic and Student Affairs. So again, sorry, I know that's a lot of information, but feel free to e email if you have any questions or call us. Thank you. Okay, so you might work until 2 a.m. in the computer lab, or you might stay up all night building a human-powered submarine, but sooner or later, you've got to go home and get some sleep. And so Mark Pekorski from the, a community housing manager is going to tell you a little bit about housing here at UCLA. Thank you. Um, everybody here has uh, congratulated you and, and welcomed you. Um, let me be the latest to do that. Congratulations on your admissions. I know everybody here uh, at UCLA, especially the School of Engineering and Applied Science, is very proud of the academic tradition that UCLA has and all the academic opportunities that we offer. We are equally proud of our on-campus residential community. That's right, we don't have dorms, we have a residential community. Um, I should point out, uh, in your packets, you have an uh, on-campus housing brochure, and in there, there's a little slide-out, smaller handout on dining services. UCLA is actually ranked number two among public universities for their residential dining services, so we make it easy for you to put on that freshman 15. <laughs> um, you'll actually be the last people to receive these brochures. We moved everything entirely to our website. So I really want to stress our website. That's housing.ucla.edu. You can do everything housing related from that website. You can go, you can click on My Housing. There's a My Housing icon that'll take you to the application where you would fill out and submit your application. The time you submit your application, there is a $30 non-refundable application fee. The deadline for incoming freshmen to apply for housing is Monday, May 3rd at 4 p.m. You can apply for housing right now before you've submitted your statement of intent, of intent to register. In fact, we recommend that you do so just for your peace of mind to know that you have a guarantee of a housing offer. Before I get back to that, other, thing, other features about the website, Ask Housing is another icon that'll take you to a database of more than 800 commonly asked questions, which we review and update regularly. You can search by keyword or phrase. If you can't find an answer to your question, you can submit a question and someone on our staff will get back to you by 9 a.m. the next business morning. So again, all of this you can find from housing.ucla.edu. UCLA offers a guarantee of housing for three consecutive years for incoming freshmen. That's provided that you submit your application by the deadline, again for you incoming freshmen, that's Monday, May 3rd by 4 p.m. And then your housing guarantee would continue as long as you meet all subsequent payments. We have three different facility types and you can rank your preference of facility type on the application. There are residential plazas, those would be doubles or triples, those would have either a private or shared bathroom. There are residence halls, which are high-rise buildings, that's maybe more of the prototypical, what you might think of when you hear the word dorm. Uh, those would also have communal baths. And then there are residential suites, which would have a shared living room, two bedrooms, and a shared bath. The most common assignment for freshmen would be a plaza or a res hall, and the most common assignment for a freshman would be a triple. For 2009-10, the current academic year, 4,200 freshmen decided to live on campus in our residential community. That was 92% of our freshman class. 87% of those freshmen had a triple assignment. So it depends on availability. We'll match you with the highest availability based on your preferences on your application. But triples are by far the most common assignment, so keep that in mind. We will be launching housing tours later this afternoon. We'll have student volunteers. Many of them are engineering students, but not all. Some are bio or chem majors or poli sci or history or even art. Undoubtedly, many of them chose those majors because they knew they couldn't get into the School of Engineering. But don't, <laughs> don't hold that against them. They can provide a lot of insight into what, into what living on campus is like 
those tours will launch uh, on your schedule. It says 2 p.m. We'll probably be ready to, to go a little earlier than that, probably closer to 1.30. We'll launch just outside Royce Hall, the top of the steps on your right. Plan on those tours lasting 30 to 40 minutes. It's about a 10-minute walk, 10 to 20 minutes there in the residential community, and 10 minutes back. Those students will take you to their room, so you'll get a chance to see the different room types. It's unlikely because there are so many of you that will be able to show you multiple rooms. So if there's a specific room type that you absolutely have to see, let our staff know and we may pull you aside from one group and have you go in the next group. But again, all the tour guides can talk about what the differences are. They'll point out the dining facilities as, as you walk along. They'll be able to show you, give you a good glimpse at what residential life is like here at UCLA. So again, welcome and thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Mark. Now, now remember, three is the magic number. You'll probably be in a triple. You have three years of guaranteed housing. You got to apply by May 3rd. Okay, so do that. Okay, you don't want to be calling up on May 4th and saying, ah, I didn't do it. Because, you know, there are just only so many rooms. I mean, if, I'm sure if Mark has a room, he'll be happy to give it to you. But if you apply on May 4th and we're full, that's not so good, okay? So go ahead and do that. It's a good idea just to get it out of the way, like he says. Just apply now, and then if, if you decide not to come to UCLA, okay, 30 bucks. But if you are coming, you got the housing thing down. It's really important to have a place to live. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. And now, look at that. We're only 30 minutes late. That's great. That's much better than last year. Okay, so um, we're going to have to abbreviate the question and answer session. But the thing is... This isn't your last chance to ask a question. You'll be able to ask questions in the departmental session, and you'll also be able to ask questions as you mingle and have lunch after the departmental session or for mechanical, um, if you're in that, the right part of the alphabet before when you're mingling. But, but let's take a few questions, and there are some mics. There's a mic down here in front and down here in front, so if you've got a, a nice question that you feel like is a school-wide type of question that you'd like to ask, uh, does anybody have a question? Raise your hand. Wow. Uh, oh, great. So come on down. Um, Leah, are you here? Uh, yes, we're trying. This is the first year we're recording this to put it up on YouTube. So we're actually breaking, but YouTube, it has to be in certain chunks. So we're, so um, unless we screw up, yes. This is our first year to do that. We hope it's successful. I think it will be, but it'll be up on the UCLA YouTube site. Okay? Yes. Um, any? Oh, that and that was a great question, by the way. We're really proud of that. Yes, and, and on the balcony. Yeah, it, it's pretty likely. Um, we actually have there's something called the UCLA profile um, where you can look and see. And I don't remember the statistic. I'm sorry. I don't want to tell you a number I'm not sure about. I know that it's like 91% in five years or something like that. But look on the UCLA profile to get the exact numbers. But it's in the 80s. You know, it, it can be done. And, and we're working really hard in the School of Engineering to bring it down even further. So to, the, to do, there are things that we can do to make sure that courses are available and to offer certain courses during the summer. So if you fall behind, you can catch up. And we're doing those things. Lots of people are leaving, so i got to say something now. Um, please don't leave just yet until you hear this, and then you can walk out. Let me tell you something. If you're undeclared, you do not have to choose your major today. Okay? So we have sessions for each of the majors, and there's an undeclared session. And I'd like to say that if you're undeclared, why don't you come to the undeclared session, and we'll talk about that process of making a decision, including telling you about the, the guarantee you have as an undeclared student. Um, you know, it was a very different... Getting admitted to UCLA engineering is difficult. Getting admitted to UCLA undeclared, it's actually the most difficult thing. So, um, so I'll take one more question before we head out. Does it, uh, yes, sir. We're kicking butt. Um, uh, I'd like to tell you that this is, I didn't have time, you know, I have so many things I want to tell you and I, I'm limited. You can see it kind of bursts out 
in spurts as I in between speakers. But um, Dean Deere, uh, you know, when he took over as dean, he started, we got to build another building. And we built Engineering 5, which is an awesome building that houses the bioengineering department and the material science department, and it's brand spanking new. Um, do you guys like, you like that building? Yeah. Um, so, and, and you might think, oh, man, we're in a recession. Uh, it's not that we can't build another building. But, you know, within months of Engineering 5 uh, being built, I'm sitting in the dean meeting, dean's meeting, and, 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 and Dean Deere was saying, we got to build Engineering 6. we got to start now. And, um, in fact, there's a really important point to make. So it's kind of difficult. Like, money is just not lying around now. You can realize that the state's in trouble. But um, it turns out this is a great time to build a building because the contractors, aren't, they don't have anything to do. They'd love to build your building, and they'll give you a great deal. So, so the point is that if we start building Engineering 6 now, we can build it at a discount. And what we'll have to, to, we have to take out a loan to do it, but we feel like it's the right thing. And actually, we've got this great associate dean for um, research and physical resources, Dean Jane Chang, who actually applied to NSF and got $7.5 million to renovate Bolter Hall, the current building that we have. And she's also working with uh, Dean Deere to get started on Engineering 6 um, as soon as possible. And we're, we're working with the campus trying to, and I think we've done it, we're working very hard to convince the central administration that the best thing they can do is let engineering build Engineering 6 now. It's going to save the campus money over the long haul. So actually, um, I'm really proud of what we're doing in terms of infrastructure for this school. We've got a lot of things that we have done that we're proud of. And we're constantly trying to find, not just with infrastructure, but with everything, how can we do it even better? And that's something you'll, I think you'll learn more about when you visit the departments, about how each department, they're really good. But we're not sitting around doing nothing. It's like, OK, we're good. How can we be better next year? And that's, it's really exciting to be a part of that. Um, so now we've got to go. Um, and so head on out to the courtyard. And when you leave Royce Hall, look for the banner that lists your cho chosen major. And then you can go to that special session. Thank you very much. <laughs>